Hello. Good morning, Calvary Chapel La Mesa. We are glad you're here today. And uh, God's going to do a mighty work because His Spirit is here. And He loves you. Isn't that great? God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for all of our lives and purpose and meaning. And uh, in the book of John, it says this. Jesus is talking here. He says, I am the vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You know, um, in the back of our yard, we have flowers and I hadn't pruned them in ages. And I pruned them about a month ago, cut them all back, and I looked at them yesterday. There are so many beautiful roses growing everywhere in the backyard. And I go, ooh, I should have pruned them a long time ago. And God prunes us. You know, he takes us and through trials and tribulations so that we would ha uh, be stronger and have faith in him. And so he prunes it that we would bear more fruit. Ask the person next to you, are you bearing fruit? And then he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. God's word cleanses us. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. We need to be abiding in Jesus, right? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, we can do what? Nothing. Nothing apart from him. You know, when I cut branches off of those rose bushes and they fell to the ground, guess what happened to them? They died because they were not connected to the vine anymore. And so we need to have the nourishment of God's word. We need to be connected to the vine. And I'm glad you're here today. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would cleanse us, renew our spirits. Give us a fresh touch of you today as we abide in you, Lord. Thank you for every person here those that are coming, those that are joining us online. May you be lifted up. May you be exalted. May we learn from you today. You know, the Pharisees were studying the scriptures, and uh, Jesus said to them, it's, it's the scriptures that speak of me. As we study your word, it speaks of you. May we grow in our relationship with you. May we mature in our lives that we would bear fruit for you, Lord. Thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in the Lord. May this be a great day of rejoicing here at Calvary Chapel La Mesa. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
here. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bulls will sing.
Isn't it great that uh, you call on God in prayer and he answers us? And you don't get a busy signal. And you don't get a thing that says press one, press two, press three, you know. And then at the end of the line, leave your message, you know. No. I want you to take some time and just a couple minutes and just introduce yourself to people around you. Make them feel at home. Glad you're here. Good to see you, John. Morning, everyone. Thank you so much for serving. Yeah. I wish I could play. I know. All right, it's great to see the family of God just, I mean, you know, sometimes you just sit in church and, you know, you don't get an opportunity to say hello to people and you, you then afterwards they leave and you, you know, oh man, I didn't get a chance to say hello to them. So it's good. Full house today. That's great. Praise God. And uh, we wanted you to continue to pray for Linda Beasel and as she's going through the radiation uh, treatment today and she's such her and her husband are such an active part of our church family so keep lifting them up in prayer and uh, if you have a June calendar I think we handed out last week but there's plenty of these on the back and uh, it's good to put them up somewhere so just remind you of things that are going on and on Tuesday this week is seniors Bible study it starts at 1030 for all the seniors come and join us for that and then on Wednesdays, our regular Wednesday night Bible study. Tuesdays, Tuesday night Bible study. Thursday this week is men's Bible study. Where's Tony? Tony, raise your hand up there. He's doing a great job leading that men's Bible study. 
going through the book of James. So come and join us, 6.30 Friday, Praise and Worship Night. And then there's a special thing happening this coming Saturday. And there should be a flyer, I think, in your bulletins about that. Everybody have a flyer on that? Work day. I don't have one. I need another one. Do you have one there? Okay, so this is for anybody in the body. Um, it starts at 8 o'clock, and we'll be done at noon, and then we're going to have a um, uh, luncheon together, a free luncheon as the body of Christ, and we'll be doing a bunch of different things, you know, painting, cleaning windows, carpets, just kind of taking care of the sanctuary and the classrooms and then outside as well. And uh, this is what happened in the book of Nehemiah. I mean, they had people that were set aside, groups of people that did different things in the sanctuary and outside the sanctuary. So this Saturday, this is for all of us. It's going to be a great work day, good time of fellowship together. So if you can, come and join us. And then also in your bulletins, you have, oh, I got one. I found it. <laughs> um, there's so many things we're handing out today. Uh, what's or twists and turns, VBS Bible study. Um, you may ha not have kids in the house, but maybe you have grandkids and live in the area, or neighbors. This will be for ages 2 to 12. But also, if anybody here um, wants to help out, uh, Stephanie, raise your hand in the back. You can talk to her about helping out during that time. Uh, we tried to do it uh, hours so that they can still get home and get to sleep at night. 4 p.m. to 6 p uh, 15. They had a great time last year. And uh, you can see following Jesus changes the game. It changes our lives when we follow Jesus. And so they're going to have a fantastic time. It's free. You know, we encourage all the kids. If you're over 12, uh, the kids can come and help and be a part of it as well. And uh, so VBS, and that is July 10th to July 14th. Now, is anybody here, how many of you were baptized as adults? Raise your hands. Anybody? Quite a few of you. If you've never been baptized, maybe you did it. You didn't do it. Your parents did it for you, but they took you to a church. And, you know, you had no idea what was going on, and you never made that commitment to Christ. But now you have, and you want to, you know, be obedient. And it says, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we're having an opportunity to be baptized. Something different. This flyer talks about it. We're going to be doing a, a potluck and baptism on a Saturday night here at the church, starting at 5 o'clock with a big potluck. Encourage you to invite your friends and relatives and, you know, um, people that know you as a witness to them that you want to represent Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then uh, we'll have our regular Saturday service after that at 6.30. But then also Sunday for the Sunday group, right after church, we're also going to have a baptism. So keep put that on your calendar so you can plan on staying, supporting those that are being baptized. And then we're going to have a big, gigantic potluck together. And that will be on Sunday, July 2nd. Anybody have any questions about that? Bring a change of clothes. Bring a towel. And it's going to be a great time. And we're going to have worship and praise in, in our regular Sunday service. So, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also walk in newness of life. Tell the person next to you, you're a new person in Christ Jesus. So I don't care how old you are, as long as you know what baptism means, come and be baptized. We just baptized, uh, she was 88 years old. We just baptized an 88-year-old in her bathtub at her house. She wanted to be baptized. It was great. It was exciting. So use that as an opportunity. One other thing we're going to be doing. Man, we've got a lot of things to do. In the month of June... On June 29th, there's five uh, Thursdays in this month. We have women's Bible study, then men's Bible study this week, then women's Bible study, then men's Bible study. On the 29th, we're going to have a 
new service here at the church, and it's going to be a church a service that's going to be in Spanish. We're going to have a Spanish service. And we have uh, three guys. Ernie's one of them over there. He's, he's here every service, and God's changed his life. And Ernie and Omar and uh, Ricardo is going to lead worship. It's going to be translated into English, but it's a new service to start at 630. And these three guys are on fire for Jesus, and they're going to be leading it in Spanish. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, we're going to try to do it once a month for a while and just see how it goes. And, hey, why not, right? And so they're going to use their gifts and talents and abilities in putting that together and that will be June 29th, and we'll get that in the calendar. Anybody have a praise report today they'd like to give God thanks for and praise for? Yes, John? I'm just looking at the line out there. Let me just make sure. That's only the second people. 43 years old, praying as this room, the best I've ever seen. I've been praying like that for a long time. That started off for a while, and then it came back to the church when I was 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. It's all the way to the end of the parking lot, and it's just one vine. Right. It's one vine, and it is just taken off. It's so beautiful. Just like that verse that we read today, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Anybody else have a praise report they want to share with the rest of the body? Yes, go ahead. All right. Praise God. You look peaceful. Anybody else? <laughs> it's your haircut, yeah. All right, let's have the ushers come forward and... Uh, We'll receive the tithes and the offerings. Give as God has blessed you, not under compulsion, not because somebody's standing there with a gun to your head and saying, hey, give. No, God loves a, a, just a cheerful giver. So, Jim, would you uh, bless these tithes and offerings? Okay. Amen. Now, all the kids that are here, we have a great Sunday school for you. And so you can head out through those doors. And uh, the nursery is open and available for you as well. So this is for all the kids. You can go to your classes. And uh, parents can pick you up afterwards.
it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop. Amen. He's a miracle worker, isn't he? Promise keeper. I want you to take out your outlines. Everybody should have an outline. If you don't have one, uh, just raise your hand. And the, There's a couple over here that don't have them. Everybody needs an outline, okay? And the junior high and high school group can also go to their class. And, uh, you know, this is God's plan for our lives. Does God have a plan for our lives? Yes, he does. He does. He has purpose. He has meaning for our lives. And uh, so this is a great study today as we're going through the book of Nehemiah. Now, last week, if you weren't here, or just a reminder to those that were here, at the top of your outline, it kind of gives you an overview of what happened in Nehemiah chapter 10, which we called the day of decision. It was a day of decision. Are you going to choose God or are you going to choose the world and the world system? Hopefully you're going to choose God, right? Hopefully you're going to choose God. And so it was a day of decision for the people in Nehemiah chapter 10. Another word for that is priorities. They were establishing their priorities. Now all of us here in this room, hopefully you have established priorities, and hopefully number one is God, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Put him first. Seek first God in his kingdom, in his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you, right? So f priorities. Five areas of priorities. Remember from last week. The first one, so important. Putting God first in our homes and our families. Is God number one in your homes and your families? Making him first place on your heart. And hopefully that's what we want to do here at this church. We want to put God first. And it starts with the home and the families. Satan is attacking the home. And he's attacking families. He comes to kill and steal and destroy, you know, our youth and destroy, you know, all of us. That's why it says submit to God resist satan and he will what but what do you got to do first submit to god there's a lot of you know different organizations out there that deal with addictions and different things but until you submitted to god nothing's going to happen submit to god first number two was not compromising even as christians so often people compromise their priorities are wrong and so having faith in God and not compromising what God has said in his word is so important. Don't compromise. And then number three on your outline is forgiveness. So many people have a lack of forgiveness in their lives. There's bitterness. There's resentment. Their hearts are not right. They have hard hearts towards someone else. 
And God says, hey, before you come to the altar, you know, make sure you have forgiven as God has forgiven you. God wants us to forgive. So that was number three priority, forgiveness. Number four was on finances, being God's stewards over everything that he's given to you. You're to be a steward over the things that God has blessed you with, the things that God has entrusted you with. And then number five, which we'll talk a little bit further in chapter 11 today, is service to God, faithfulness. God wants faithful men and women that are willing to turn over their lives to him, that want to be lights in this dark and wicked world in which we live. Not joining in with the dark world and the wickedness and the evil, but being set apart for God's use. God wants all of us to be set apart for his use. And I, I hope that we are, you know, making an impact for Jesus, it says on the outline. Not ourselves, but God being glorified, stirring up love and good works in each other, encouraging one another, doing acts of kindness, showing compassion, showing mercy, walking humbly before our God, doing what is right. Doing what is right. You know, and when we don't do what is right and we're not walking with God, then if you're a Christian, God has his spirit that's convicting you and saying, you need to repent. You need to ask God's forgiveness. You need to ask for healing in your life. And that's what happened last week. And now we're headed into chapter 11. And uh, it's a great chapter that talks about, hey, putting God's will to action in our lives. Being obedient to God. What is God's will? Are you just going through life and you don't know what God's will is? for your life is what is his purpose what gives life meaning in our lives and uh first of all I'll turn to jeremiah chapter 29 it's on page 1098 <laughs> you may have to look it up in your index in the front the book of jeremiah i want you to underline this verse in your bible star it Try to memorize it, okay? It's so important, memorizing God's word. And Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you. Does God know what the plans that he has for us? He does. Well, they're talking to Israel, but they're also talking to us, declares the Lord. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare. That doesn't mean going on welfare, but plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. One thing that's so sad in our society today is nobody has hope. And God is the God of hope, and he wants us to give us hope and a future. And he says in verse 12, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you. You know, God's given us a purpose. He's given us meaning in our lives. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter if you've, had, you've been in prison, you know, or things that you've done in your past, because God forgives and he heals and he uses that to be a light to other people. You know, all those different things. God can use you in his service. I, you know, I was thinking about the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples were not people that I would look for or anybody would really look for to start a revolution, you know, across the world. I, they would, you wouldn't choose those 12. You would choose CEOs of big organizations and other things. But God chose us. He chose those disciples and it started the greatest spiritual re revolution there ever has been in the world. Tell the person next to you, God wants to use you. He wants to use all of us. Nehemiah chapter four, uh, 7, verse 4. It says... Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, 
and their houses were not yet built. They were still living in tents and different things, and you know, uh, but the houses weren't there. And so here's this big, great city called Jerusalem. It was mostly empty. Nobody wanted to live in Jerusalem. You know, it, the walls now have been rebuilt. The gates have been set up. The temple was there. But this, this is called the city of David. This was the city of God's house. But there was still a lot of rubble for when the walls had been destroyed previously and all the houses and, and there was trash and all this other stuff. And there was really no way to provide for your family in this, at this point in time in Jerusalem. And so, you know, the, the walls of defenses were, were, no people was there. The enemy could just come and attack. And so what happened is, look at Nehemiah chapter 11. <clears throat> how can we make it strong? How can this really be the capital city? You know, how can this be a, a way to provide for your family, you know, and, and be defended from the enemies? And so Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 1, the leaders of the people... They were living in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine tenths remained in the other cities. So it would be like this. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm sorry, John, you've got to move to Jerusalem. <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> one in ten had to move to Jerusalem, okay? I mean, this is the way God was working this out. I was thinking, man, casting lots, what happened? Is there a time in my life where they cast lots? And I remember when I was 18 years old, the Vietnam War was taking place, and they had a lottery. Remember the lottery? And everybody's name was put in the, you know, whatever it was, the basket, you know, and they pulled out numbers, and you, when your number came up, if it, and, and it kept, the numbers kept going up as who, who was going to be drafted. And so I was in that lottery. And the numbers kept pulling up. And I kept wondering, when's my number going to come up? And it turned out that I was number 174 or something like that out of 365. And that particular year, I think they took, I think it was 140, up to 140 you had to enter into the Army, Navy, Marines, or whatever it was. And that was a draft that took place. And there was a lot of people that did not go in willingly. They weren't happy about it, you know, and conscientious objectors and all kinds of other things rose up. It was a hard time in our country. And so here the people said, well, let's just cast lots. That's a fair way of doing it. And uh, no excuses. They weren't trying to get out of it. They would move to the city of Jerusalem where the greatest, nitty, uh, the greatest need was. They were filling the city up with people. But how much better would it have been if the people volunteered? Willingly. As, uh, as like in giving tithes. Not under compulsion. But a cheerfully going back to God's city, Jerusalem. And so what happened... Look at verse 2. So exciting. And the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. There is a, a lot of different groups of people that wanted to serve God, to do his will, and they volunteered. I'll go. They wanted to make God's city great. And uh, Nehemiah says in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, God put it on my heart, and the good hand of God was upon me. And it was so true that God put that on their hearts, that they would do that. They would be committed. They wanted to serve God in that way. And so in chapter 11, here's all these different groups of people that were led in this way, where they saw a need, and they volunteered their service to meet the need. And God's blessing was upon them. As we're going to see in chapter 12, I mean, it was so exciting. It says, the joy of the Lord is my what? Strength. And they were so excited. They had two groups of people that walked around the walls, and they were praising God. And it says, the joy of the people 
were heard from afar, from the nations, from the cities surrounding them. There was such a joy. And that's the way it should be when we come to church, right? Oh, I got to listen to another message by Pastor Dave. I got to see those people again, that, you know, and oh, man, you, you got to twist my arm to come. No, it should be a joy that we want to be in the presence of God and brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's what happened as a result of them being obedient to God. They wanted the, to be in the place of God's blessing, God's choosing for their lives. And, you know, just generally, we are all called to be witnesses for God, right? We are called to be lights. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We are to be lights, to make disciples, you know, of all people, people that you work with, people that you live around. You know, to be a light in the midst of this dark world. Is it a dark world? In the midst of this dark world in which we live. And if Jesus can change the hearts of those 12 disciples, God can change our hearts. And he wants to change our hearts. And uh, unfortunately, Satan doesn't like it when you start to change. And he will attack you. Um, look at Luke chapter 10. Turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 10. And it says in verse 2, here is Jesus talking. He appointed 70 others in verse 1 and sent them out two by two to every city, every place where he was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful. There's people that need to be saved, that need to know Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, just like today. But the laborers are what? Few. How sad. The laborers are few. You know, across the United States, there's churches that are closing every week. Hundreds of churches closing because they don't have pastors or they don't have workers. And so they just close, or the finances, so they just close the doors. I mean, we should be opening up more churches. You know, not closing churches. There's such a need in our society today. So the harvest is there. It's plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out what? Labors into his, his harvest. Where's the workers? You know, I hear this a lot. I'm too tired. I worked all week. Can't serve in the Sunday school. You know, I, I can't be an usher. You know, I have to get there early and clean things up. The, I'm worn out by... What's going on throughout the week? I can't make a commitment, you know, to spiritual things, you know. Um, hey, I did it when I was younger. Let somebody else do it. Somebody else. Who's the somebody else? And so serving, you know, uh, handing out food, you know, the food ministry, doing cleanup, you know, on the Saturday or whatever it may be, ushering telling people about Jesus, evangelism, leading worship. You know, we have some great worship leaders, but leading worship, you know, and people say, well, I'm done with that. I'm too busy. I'm too old. I'm retired. What does the word retired mean? You may have retired from your job, but do we ever retire from being Christians? No. You know, we're Christians until we die, and then we get to be in the Lord with heaven, in heaven because to be absent from the body as a Christian is to be in the presence of God. You know, so God, you know, is he's got a job for us in heaven as well, whatever it may be, but God wants us to serve. How can I serve God? Uh, there's a, a family that takes food out to people that don't have any food every week. Take food out. I can remember when I was just a young whippersnapper, I think I was 26. And uh, they were asking for someone to go to the Sharp Hospital Rehabilitation Center where people there are paraplegic and other things. 
and they have to be wheeled into a room, and they, they didn't have anybody to do a worship service for them. So they're asking for, for volunteers, and I was thinking, I can do that, you know, Sunday after church. I could go over there and serve there. And I can remember in my heart, you know, after a while, it seemed like, oh, I'm thinking, uh, so many things are going on, you know, so many places on Sunday afternoon, and, and you know, I, do I really want to go? And, you know, struggling in my flesh. You ever struggle in your flesh about something? And I would go, and there would be 10, 12 people that would be rolled into a room, and they were so excited that somebody would come and do a worship service for them. They were jazzed. And, and I, I, every time I left, I thought, how could I have not wanted to come and do this service today? I was more blessed than they were. I know I was. And, you know, service to the Lord, being obedient to what God's calling you to do. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to see in chapter 11 that they were using their gifts in the place of service, and there was a lot of places of service. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, here's a great chapter on, on just using your gifts, and it says this. It says, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, verse 1, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be unaware about the spiritual gifts. In verse 4, there's a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There's a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. Each one, verse 7, is given the manifestation of the spirit so that they may be exalted. Is that what it says? No, it says for the common good. Every person in this room, you've been given a gift for the common good, the building up of the body of Christ. And then he lifts some of the gifts. He says in verse 8, To one is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another faith, to another the gifts of healing, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of those tongues. And then he says in verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as who wills? God wills. So here in this room, you know, each one has been given a gift as God wills to be used for the building up of the body of Christ, that we would go and make disciples. You know, and a lot of people say, well, I'm not a worship leader. God can't use me. Yeah, he can. You know, I'm not a preacher. God can't use me. Yeah, he can. He wants to use you. And so he says in verse 12, even as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, we are one body. For by one spirit we are baptized into one body. For the body is not one member, verse 14, but what? Many members. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? So what he's going to say here is every part of the body is important to God. Every part. You know, whether you're single, married, have children, don't have children, you know, grandparents, old, young, you know, had issues in your past, and, you know, whatever it may be, you're part of the body. And then he says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. Verse 16, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. If the whole body, verse 17, were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Here it is, verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of you in the body, just as he desired. Just as he desired. You're part of the body of Christ. You know, um, Linda's not with us, you know, because of, you know, the 
cancer and the things that are going on in her body. But she's missed in this body. You know, because she's so joyful all the time. You know, and she reaches out to so many different people. And, you know, it's just like a light. You know, I mean, when I grow up, I want to be like Linda. But, you know, every one of us have different gifts. The gift of helps, the gift of ministration. You know, there's so many different gifts that God has given to this body. Turn to Romans chapter 12. God says, don't neglect the gifts that God has given to you. Don't neglect them. And in Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then he says in verse 6, And since we have gifts, we have gifts. You are important to the body of Christ. You have gifts. They differ according to the grace given to us. Let each exercise them accordingly. Don't neglect those gifts that God has given to you. And then it says, If prophecy, verse 6, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving. He who teaches in his teaching. He who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And then, you know, there's another passage that talks about gifts. But we've been all given gifts, places of service. Every one of us here in this room. So when you go back to Nehemiah chapter 11, here he now is, has this list of all these different groups of people that were ministering, that came back to minister in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, using their gifts and talents and abilities that God had given to them. And it's a, it's a great list here that he has for us. And, uh, you know, there was the priests, there was the Levites, there was the leaders of worship, the ministering priests. It says in verse 6, Nehemiah eleven six. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem, 468 able men. Verse 8, and there was Gabi and Sali, 928 of them. And then in verse 10, and from the priests, there was Jedediah, the son of Jeram and Jachan. So the priests were there. And then it says in, in uh, verse 10, for verse 11, and uh, the leaders of the house of God were there in verse 11. And then in verse 12, and their kinsmen who performed the work of the temple. There were 822 of them. And then in, in verse 13, in his kingdom, the heads of the father's household, there were 242 of them. And then there were their brothers, these valiant warriors, verse 14, 128 of them. And then in verse 15, there was the Levites, the leaders of the Levites who were in charge of the outside work of the house of God. You know, have you noticed when you drove up how beautiful the outside is looking? Where's the guy in the body that just loves to plant things and flowers and all kinds of things and out there sweeping and cleaning things up and it, and it looks so beautiful taking care of the outside of the sanctuary and uh, there's people that take care of the inside of the sanctuary ushers you don't even see there's a lady here that comes every week and she sets up the chairs perfectly makes sure there's things in the backs of the chairs make sure there's no crumbs or anything on the floor make sure the bathrooms are clean and she's got a bad back, a really painful uh, thing going on in her body. But that's her gift of service. And I say, hey, just you don't need to be doing all that. We don't want to hurt your back. And she says, that's how I serve the Lord. And she's so excited about it every week. And then she comes and helps out in service on Thursday night, on Sunday, Saturday night. 
And it's wonderful as the body joins in in all these different areas of service. You know, when we go to the food bank, there's guys here that go to the food bank, come back from the food bank, unload all the food, make sure the table, the pantry table's all full for the next service, and they clean up. And, you know, it's a gift of service that they do for the body of Christ. That's what was going on in Nehemiah chapter 11. The body working together in all these different areas. It says in verse 15, the leaders of the Levites who were in charge of the outside work. And then there was the leader in verse 17 <clears throat> in beginning the thanksgiving at prayer. And then the Levites, verse 18, that were in the city were 284 men. <clears throat> they were not allowed to minister in the, altar, in the altar, in the holy place. That was for the priests. But they served outside working in the house of God. And uh, they were doing God's choosing, using their gifts and talents. Look at verse 19. And there was gatekeepers. There were 172 gatekeepers that were doing their work of service for God's glory. All these different people. In verse 22. Now the overseer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, the son of Bani, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Mathaniah, the son of Micah, the sons of Asaph. I had to practice these words in front of a mirror. <laughs> but look who they were. They were the singers for the service of the house of God. They were the worship leaders. You know, the song leaders. I, I mean, I love worship. There's a, it's, it's part of our worship to God as we just worship the Lord. And, but you don't want me leading worship. You know, they do a great job leading worship. And, you know, then God inhabits our praises, however bad it is or whatever. But, you know, God wants us to be worshiped. And so there were leaders of worship that took place. And faithful men and women that chose to fear God and to serve God. A couple more verses before we close. Turn to Psalms 84. Psalms 84. Everybody still with me? Psalms 84 verse 2 says my soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God and then he says in verse 10 a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside one day in the courts of the Lord is better than a thousand outside I would rather stand at the threshold, doorkeeper of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Unfortunately, a lot of people want to dwell in the tents of the wicked. You know, they don't want to come to, and worship God with brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a sad thing. Or they get involved in other things that take them away from worship of God's word. You know, I... I think I told you, I don't know when it was, but I, we go and pick up Helen on Sunday mornings, and as we go and pick up Helen, we see people walking their dog. You know, we see people climbing uh, Cow's Mountain. You know, we see there's a, one school that always has soccer going on, and they're out there with soccer. They don't care about God. They, they don't care about Jesus. You know, they don't care about what's going to happen for eternity. They're having a good time playing soccer on a Sunday morning. You know, and, and I joined a, a, a little league board, and it was a battle because they wanted to have practices and they wanted to have games on Sunday morning. And I said, no. You know, I, 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 I had been there for a long time as a coach and, you know, different things, and so I earned my place on the board, and I said, no, let's keep that as a day for the Lord. And they said, you know what, you're right. We've got other times that we can practice and we can have games. And uh, 
God's looking for godly men and women that want to serve him, that want to be obedient to him. And that's all of you here in this room and all those watching online. Turn to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 6. It's somewhere in your Bible. <clears throat> Page 1298. Micah chapter 6. <clears throat> he says in verse 8, God has told you, old man, what is good. God's told you what is good. And what does the re Lord require of you but to do justice, <clears throat> to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God? That's what God wants. He wants us to do justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before our God. To have a <clears throat> a real personal relationship with Jesus. The Old Testament <clears throat> has a lot to say to us. It encourages us. It exhorts us. It stirs our hearts to be obedient to God and follow his will. And I hope every person here will do that. Every believer has been given a special gift of service, a place of God's choosing God says, be not drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with his spirit. God wants us to be filled with his spirit every day. Every day, be filled with his spirit. You know, that vine out there, I was wondering, it was getting really saggy and it was getting brown. Places on it were dying. And I was going... What's going on? And uh, the reason was nobody watered it. <laughs> nobody watered it. And, and so it would die, right? And God says we need to be watered with the washing of his word continually. The cleansing of his word. Working together in God's place of ministry, just like they were in Nehemiah's day. You know, no strife. There was no contention. There was no selfish desires. The flesh didn't get in the way. Everybody working for the building up of the body of Christ for the work of ministry. That's the way the body of Christ should be at every church. You know, I mean, it's a joy to be part of the family of God. It's a privilege. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting, Everlasting life. We, do, we, we have a short life here on this earth. But where are you going to spend eternity? You know, my mom's 91 years old, almost 92, very shortly. And, you know, the most important thing is, does she know or do all of us know where we're going to spend eternity and then glorify God here on this earth every way we can, doing his will, serving, being obedient, being faithful. And the ushers are going to come forward and we're going to take communion. Put away your notes. And I want you to think about your life right now. Is there anything in your life that's keeping you, holding you back from being obedient to God and serving him by using your gifts and talents? Is some area of the flesh, disobedience, bitterness, resentment, you know, um, un unforgiveness, uh, just those different things of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, too busy, worn out, exhausted, don't have time to serve God. You know, and God, his spirit convicts us who is number one in our lives. Who is the most important person in our lives? And maybe we've fallen short. 
your wife knows it, your husband knows it, your kids know it, you know, you, you're, you're grumpy, you <sighs> always want to watch the TV, you know, spend hours watching a game. But how's your spiritual life going? How's your relationship with Jesus going? So right now, if God's showing you, not because the pastor said it, but God's showing you that you need a change in your life. You need a fresh, new touch of God's Spirit. And I want you to raise your hand right now and say, yep, that's me. Anybody else? Lord, pour out your spirit upon us. Renew us. Refresh us. Your word says that we are new people in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so Satan's right there and he's telling you lies. He's setting his traps for you. God can't love you. Look what you've done. God can't use you. I'm sure Satan was right there trying to get the disciples and got one of them, but yeah, God can use you. God can change your heart. So right now as we sing this song, I invite you to come, stand up. They'll let you through the rows. Come forward as the body of Christ here at Calvary. In obedience to God, we're going to be taking communion. As often as you do this, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you do it. And so, Jesus, we want to remember you dying on the cross for us, forgiving us, healing us, setting us free from Satan's slavery. Come as we sing. So 
great God. You're a merciful God. You're a compassionate God. You love us unconditionally. You bought us by your death on the cross. You redeemed us from the pit. Lord, you want to bless us. You want us to be obedient to you. You want us to be sold out to you and not to this world, Lord. There's nothing good there. Satan is a loser. He's trying to steal our joy, steal our kids, steal our families. He's a liar. He's a thief. But you say you came to give us life and life more abundantly. And you proved how much you loved us by dying on the cross for us, Lord. You took all the pain, the 39 lashes of the cattail with the pieces of glass and metal on your back. You took the beatings. You took that crown of thorns with those so very long thorns in Israel pushed on your head. But you took it all for us. God, that we might have forgiveness of our sins. Josephus tells us that 265,000 lambs were slaughtered on the altar every year. The blood payment was made for their sins. And you say you bought us once and for all. God, we are new people. In Christ Jesus. We have things that you want us to do. You want us to walk in your will, Lord, not in the will of this world. And you said that this bread, when you broke it and gave it to your disciples and the others that were gathered in that upper room, you said, this is my body that was broken for you. As often as you eat it, as long as you take communion, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, I pray that we'd never forget you and what you did for us when you said, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. While we were yet sinners, you bought us. So we remember your sacrifice as we take of this little piece of bread now. In Jesus' name, take and eat. Thank you for your blood shed for us. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You shed your blood once and for all. The forgiveness of our sins. Don't let Satan continually bring up those sins that you ask forgiveness for. Thank you for forgiving our sins. As far as the east is from the west, you remember them no more. God, we're here to serve you to do your will. We partake of this juice in reminder to us of the new covenant that came through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Take and drink. Please pass your cups to the center. I don't know what you're doing the rest of the day, but go out in the name of Jesus, right? Be a light in this world.
Be a light. Shine for Jesus everywhere you go. Show mercy, show compassion, show forgiveness, show kindness. You know, as you represent Jesus out there in that world. Amen? Amen. Tell the person next to you, I'm glad to see you today. God bless you. The food pantry's open. Help yourselves. Have a great day.